oh my god i've done it again whoops i've come back out my body again what's happened you've got to go back it's not time you've got to go back why are you here and i remember i felt like a child i was like what the hell i felt really disappointed and sad and i remember him turning over to his shoulder and he's saying i'm telling her she's got to go back you've got to go back So if you would like to just um, start out with the first one and share however you feel led to share, that would be amazing. Lovely. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. It's so important to share, I think, this information right now, especially on the planet, because there's, there's so much changes going on. And I think what I learned from all of them was that literally that there is more than what we see in life, you know, and there's reasons for why it really wakes us up sort of wakes us up on our journey of who we are as an individual. So if I look at my first experience, that was the real wake up call for me. If I think of before, you know, before the actual accident, I was in a really dysfunctional relationship, really unhappy. And if I go right the way back, I, I know even from early childhood, there was, I always thought there was something more than what, you know, I was, what we could see and I could hear animals talking to me and I was communicating back with them and. You know, and I remember seeing people who'd transitioned already, who'd passed over. And I remember my mom telling me, you can't keep going around telling everybody, uh, uh, you know, that you're seeing spirits and loved ones. So I remember I just never felt that I belonged anywhere, that I really felt sort of that I was a bit weird and wacky to some degree. So when, you know, my mom sort of said to me as a teenager, stop talking to people about, you know, that you can see people around them, you know, being clairvoyant. And if you don't, they're going to lock you away. I sort of shut it down to some degree and I forgot that I was gifted to some degree. And so when the accident happened, before the accident happened, I was really down, really depressed, going for a difficult time, working really hard, having the two children and trying to, to live life in the sense of being the ideal mum, which was really difficult because really difficult being the ideal parent that you think that you're meant to be. And um, there's no manual. And I remember the day really clearly when it was in March 2002 that it was 11th of March that I was rushing the children, you know, they had their breakfast and I was just, oh, I kept thinking about, so we're going to be late for school. They were really young, five-year-old and seven-year-old. And I just kept on thinking, I need to get to work and because everything kept work, you had to do that and then you had to go home later to feed the kids and everything else and just juggling everything. And I remember I was in the office. Um, I it was based in a community centre. I worked on a project for the elderly. And I remember that part of my job, I worked closely with social services. And it was about what was best for the clients and everything. And then I remember thinking, oh, that I had to leave at a certain time during that day. And I remember that I was just thinking, I also had to get back for the kids. There was, it was just constant rush in my head all the time. And I remember when I left the office, I had a letter that I needed to post on that day. It was really important to do with a client. And I, and, and, and I was panicking, thinking I need to get back on the train to pick the children up from the school, which I dropped them off in the morning. And, and it was just going over in my head. And I, in a way, I just thought I couldn't please anyone. I couldn't please my boss. I couldn't please my work. I couldn't please the children. I couldn't please anything. And I mean, that was going over my head. So I left the office with the letter in my hands. And it was really important to remember this because this was the life changing event that happened, sort of thing. And, and I died, resuscitated. But if I'd gone a different way, it wouldn't have worked that way. So on the day, left the office, had the envelope in my hand. And I knew that envelope had to be posted so that the information for this, one of the older people that part of our project was part of, that she was going to get some care and, and attention. It was all due to this envelope being delivered to social service. And I left the office, walked out the door, walked to the end of the road. And I remember I was coming down the road and I was coming to the corner. And that was where the pedestrian crossing was. And I was still thinking, do I just stay on this side of the road and walk towards the train station to get on the train so I can go pick the children up from school. Or if they, you know, the green man comes on, someone presses the button, I'll be able to cross the road. And then 
something happened. There was about five people there. Someone did press the button. And I remember being there. I was like, okay, fine. I was meant to cross the road then. So just like, okay, I'm meant to be here. I'm meant to be crossing the road. You know, sort as a sign sort of thing. And as I'm crossing the road, again, you know, these people around me were crossing the road together. There was an island in the in the centre park off the, off the road. And I sort of stood there. And it, again, it was safe. I was looking both ways to see it was okay to cross. And it looked safe. And I remember I had the letter in my hand. And out of the blue, out of nowhere, I kept on hearing a voice saying, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. And I remember thinking this voice sounded familiar. Now, I knew it wasn't my internal voice in my head because it came out of nowhere. So I I hadn't been thinking, is everything going to be okay? I was just concentrating on posting the letter or, or you know, going to the shop to buy a newspaper. Because that was the other thing. It was like, do I buy a newspaper now or do I get to the station and pick one up? It was just all this chitter that we have in our heads. And so being on the middle line and just, just deciding, do I go straight across the road to post the net in the letter box or do I change direction, put my, you know, all my body weight was going to be on my right hand foot, crossing the road to go and buy the newspaper, the, you know, the, the sweet shop, the news agents. And so my head was there. My head was like, what should I do this or that? You know, how we go through life and stuff. And then, as I say, out of the blue that came into my mind, I could hear, like in my ear, everything's going to be okay, which didn't really make much sense because I wasn't asking the question. <laughs> and then I started like thinking, where's this voice coming from? Or this voice sounds familiar. And I remember it sounded like my nan. And my nan had died when I was 15. I was 37 then, roughly. And I was like, I couldn't understand why I was hearing my nan's voice. You know, I, I remember I used to see her, you know, after she passed over for a bit, but I hadn't heard her voice or seen her in ages in spirit. And so she sort of said to me, everything's going to be okay. And then she sort of made me think that, yes, go and get the newspaper, go and buy the newspaper from the news agents. And then I was still doubting and I was still arguing like, that doesn't make sense because if I cross the road, it's a quicker direction. And this was all going in my head. But luckily, I then went, okay, I'll buy the newspaper. And so, as I say, my body weight was all shifted to my right-hand side of my body. And I walked, walked at an angle. And this what saved my life to some degree. What happened next was that literally I didn't feel the van that had crashed into me. It was 40 miles per hour. And I just remember I saw this white light it felt like a white light around me and I remember it feeling very warm and it felt as if because it was in March in the UK in London and it was quite cold on that day but when I felt I could feel this white light around me it felt very warm and I felt as if I was being taken care of and it felt as if I had like a, a duvet or a blanket around me and I could really hear my nan's voice and I just remember where it was just white, just a white area around me and just this white open space. But I felt safe and I felt the whole time my nan was there with me. But what was physically happening was that the van had drove into my body on the left-hand side of my body and because I was at an angle, my whole right-hand side of my body had taken the physical pressure and as it drove straight through me, I bounced off the car at an angle, oh, the van, and then ended up hitting my body on my right hand side of my body. It hit the ground, but I had sort of under nine, 10 feet across it, across the floor into the air. When I came down and hit my body, I had ripped my ankle out of my ankle joint. I had seven breaks to my foot. I had to have ongoing operations for about four years to fix tendons and broken bones after. And I hit my knee. That had damaged, broken, chipped part of my kneecap and then had cartilage that was missing there. A hip, a hit my right hip, which then was fractured. And then my ribs on the right-hand side and the left-hand side were damaged. And there was like a chunk of my stomach or my belly muscle that had got caught up in it and it was badly bruised so my torso was badly bruised and the internal bleeding it was 40 miles per hour the van so 
my internal organs were vibrating internally inside and were bashing about still. And so it caused internal bleeding, damage to my gallbladder and my kidneys and my spleen. And they, there was traces of blood in my urine and everything else. And so that was my physical body had whacked down onto the ground. And that's what happened there. But I didn't feel my physical body having that impact at all, nothing. And then there was part of me that I'd left my body. And then there was part of me that was looking down at the incident and I didn't actually know it was me. And I was sort of floating from up above, looking down, didn't know that was me. And all I know was that I could hear and see people's, feel their sense of being scared. There was something wrong, that they had witnessed something, but I hadn't seen it. And again, I didn't know it was my physical body. I was just looking down and seeing this body in a funny position. And I then, some part of me had then sort of moved into this lorry driver's cab and he was radioing control, saying he was going to be late. He got stuck in traffic. I could hear the radio station that was playing on his, in his cabs saying that it was Capital Radio saying that there'd be an accident in Essex Road in London and that they were going to be, someone was going to be airlifted. So all the road was blocked off and they were going to helicopter to lift up this body. Didn't know it was still me. And I think it was only when I recognized a member of family that was looking around and saw that body that I was thinking, oh, why do they look so upset? What is it that they can see? And then I then could see my partner running down the road, that he was running down the road and with his mum to see me, which I didn't know it was to see me at the time because I wasn't even in the body. And he placed his hand on my head and he said, I, how am I going to cope with Rebecca Nathan? That was my children at the time. And then I was like, oh, and I was questioning that. But at no point during that period of time that I could feel the pain of my body or I was in my body. And then I could also see the paramedic and the ambulances arriving and they were coming and the police arriving to check on the body and stuff. So where I'd gone at the time, I, I remember that feeling of calmness. And I remember feeling that my nan was around me, my nan was guiding me, and I felt quite safe. And the whole experience of being in that white area, I just felt an expansion of space. And then there was a point where it felt like it was like a library. It felt like there were like, not corridors, but shelving system there where you could look down the shelving system and there was books on there and scrolls and big jars and other information that was stored on the shelving system. Oh, and I remember looking down and you could just see they went on for like miles, all this information. And I remember feeling that there was wisdom and knowledge. And I remember feeling that, that it, it, it was connected to me and other humans on the planet and other beings elsewhere that this information was held. And I remember a presence of a being that was standing by my side, but it was funny because I remember that's, this really reminds me, it sticks out in my mind. I looked down and I couldn't see their feet. They had no feet and they had a robe on or something and they were like gliding. And then there was a few beings that were gliding past me. They weren't walking, they were just gliding, just moving around so gracefully. And I remember it was as if the information that I could see was had held onto information regarding not just my life, but loads of other people's lives. So people on the planet, humans, it was almost as if I was being privileged to see this information. And so I, I remember being there and absorbing some information they were communicating with me and that was the thing the communication was telepathically so didn't see a mouth move didn't hear through the ears sort of thing it was a really weird sensation but telepathically I was receiving information they were guiding me through the information and I remember seeing they were pulling out documents from the shelving system pulling the documents out and I was being shown the information now it looked like 
like when you're an architect, like the blueprint to building a house or some sort of structure. And I remember that the structure or the details, it was a bit like how many past lives I've lived or showing me my life or showing me certain points in my life, what's going to happen. And I, I had this real feeling that this was meant to happen. It was meant to happen at this particular time in my life. I was meant to have had this experience of leaving my body and being shown something to, to remind me, to tell me I have to go back to remind me like why I was here on the planet, what was going on. That was really important. So I remember this information and it was them relaying this information to me. It was really important to remember it. And it was, it was just, it felt so important as if that my soul had been yearning or looking for information because I've been so unhappy because I remember kept thinking is this what life's about because if this is all that life is about I don't know if I can carry on much longer I knew I was a mum and it was important to look after my children but I also felt so unhappy and I just couldn't continue like this so this was really important that being shown this information is to say look you're being shown this information remember this information so that you know when you come back it's just that's how it kept on feeling but I also felt that I was asking questions. It was like, what will happen to Rebecca and Nathan, my five and seven year old who were at primary school? And, and I remember my name, I could hear a voice again, so everything's going to be okay. And this feeling that I, in a way I knew I had to return, but I didn't want to return. I felt at whole, at peace there. I felt it was home. And but I got a very strong feeling that also this was the place that people went to when you pass over. It's almost like weighing up scales or weighing up your life as a soul. Was you going to come back again or was you going to move on? It was, it felt like a, I mean, I kept on hearing Hall of Souls, Hall of Souls. That's what I kept on hearing. So it felt as if it was a place of, I don't know about judgment, but it felt as if that the soul decided if there was unfinished business back on the planet. That's what I was being sort of told and felt. And I, and I know like now when I, you know, as a psychic medium, when I channel that I pick up a lot of the guides that I'd had where, when I'd met them on the other side, it was like light council. There's lots of information was being told. And like, now I understand it makes sense now adding up it and looking at the bigger picture. I understand now the work that I do is that, you know, I mean, understand that that to be the Akashic records as we know, but I still call it the Hall of Souls. And when, you know, working with clients, I know that's, I find information there. And that's what it felt like. It felt that there's all this wisdom, all this knowledge that was held there for the individual souls. So when that was going on, I had this strong feeling about, you know, about my daughter and my son, worried about them. But part of me wanted to stay there. Part of me wanted to remain there. Part of me felt so at home. I wanted to stay where I was. But I knew that. While I was there also, it was like they were implanting information or knowledge or wider information. I wouldn't be able to read in a a library on planet Earth. It was almost as if they were giving me this information that was important to bring back with myself. So at some point I would use the information. I remember feeling that, that there was this wider knowledge or experience I was going to bring back with me, which seemed to be really important. And so I was there. And like knowing all these answers and all this information stuff. And it was, then there was my physical body back on planet Earth. And I remember, you know, the ambulance had arrived because I remember seeing it. I was like looking down at my body. And I remember they were cutting my clothes off my body. And it was when they placed the electric paddles to start my heart again, that that's when I was being pulled like a suction like was pulling me back to my body and I remember it felt like a a a thin part where it was a water slide coming down and I remember I was being pulled down and I I remember this great sense of loss that I didn't want to leave where I was I wanted to remain there and I remember coming back into my body really quick and then that's when I started feeling the pain it was like with a thump I came back I felt the pain in my body and it was almost like having amnesia. I remember the feeling of trying to work out where I'd been, then dealing with the pain and 
not really wanting to be where I was. I just felt I wanted to stay where I was. This is the strong feeling I felt. When they got me in the ambulance, they placed me in the ambulance. My heart stopped a few times on the way to the hospital. And I remember that I was looking at the top of the ambulance. It had a number on it and I could see that the sirens. And I remember looking down at the actual top of the ambulance and they were driving me to the hospital. And I remember when they got me into crash in A&E in the hospital that when they were cutting my clothes off, there were three sets of teams of medical staff. There were so many injuries, broken bones in my body. But I remember I was out of my body looking down and then cutting my clothes off. And I remember that feeling of feeling calm. And I remember feeling everybody, all the medical team, were really panicky and worried. And I could feel and sense their emotions and their feelings. But I, I knew that I was safe where I was. So it's almost an out of body experience. So I wasn't with the whole of souls. I wasn't there. I was just came out of my body looking down. And then I remember when they, they would x-rayed me and they put in drips in and all the medical equipment and something on my heart. And then I was intensive care for a little while. And I remember when I was in intensive care over a few days, I kept on thinking, I can feel my nan being by my side. And I remember feeling that she was holding my hand, my right hand. And this went on for a few days. And I remember when I came back out of everything, the feeling I was in and out of like consciousness. The nurse, I said to the nurse, where's my nan? And she said, no one's being here. And I said, I felt like she'd been holding my hand. But I know when I'd returned back and I, I, I for days I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress because... I just kept on having relaying and replaying. My brain was trying to deal with everything. I was in so much pain. But I also kept on feeling that there was a connection that I'd made somewhere else and I kept on drifting off. So when I thought that I was sleeping, it was almost as if I was visiting again the Hall of Souls and I was seeing it and trying to make sense of it. And it took a long time. It was like I knew there was some information I had to come back with but I couldn't remember everything that I was told. And it's only like now over the years, having the other near-death experiences that I'm understanding and I remember some of the information. So it took me about four years to recover from the injuries. I was disabled for four years in a wheelchair for two and walking stick. But, but that was the real stop, look at life, assess where you are, know that there is more to life than what you see. And then... That was the period of time that, you know, I started studying and, and looking at there must be more to life than what we see. And then I started becoming more aware of my gifts, should I say, and yeah, looking into that really. But that experience was the main one that happened. It was, an, it was sort of this guilt as well, feeling that I wanted to go back. And then I felt guilty because I'm a mum, I should be here with the children. And there was a massive guilt that I had, but the information that I'd received, I know that I had come through to me. I was receiving it. I had received it at that point, but I couldn't remember everything. And there was this feeling like, why well, can't I remember everything? So that's real amnesia. So yeah, that's what happened in that first near death experience. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that, Anne. And you said you've had a couple more experiences. Do you want to share those? Yeah, no. Yeah. I, yeah. Because it was a, a big gap. After that, that's, you know, 2002. And I think it was right about 2000. I'd, I'd always had something with my lungs. I thought I was asthmatic. And what happened was they later found out it was a different condition. I had a lung condition, but I remember really well that I, I had a chest infection and I was really feeling ill and it turned into pneumonia. And I remember sitting in my daughter's bedroom on her sofa and I, she was downstairs. And I remember that I just couldn't breathe. And I remember I was trying to catch my breath and the, the aching on my chest was pushing. It was really uncomfortable. And I remember sort of sitting there going, for God's sake, I need some help. Can someone help me? Not realizing or really saying to God or to anything else. I was just sitting there. I was so scared that I, I just couldn't catch my breath and it was really tricky and and, and to then there was this massive thump and I was, and I wasn't too sure what that, that sound was. And as I say, I was scared. I couldn't catch my breath and the aching on my chest. 
And what happened was they, I was so scared to look to the right hand side because I felt something had knelt, knelt down by the side of me, but it was in the presence of something very heavy, something very big, something very strong. And I, I didn't know what to expect. I, I didn't know if it was my imagination. I was just so scared. And as I did finally turn to the right hand side, I even had to like question what I was seeing because I didn't believe in such thing as angels at the time. I was like, I wouldn't even know what an angel looked like. I'd seen the cherub angels that you have on cards or Valentine's and, you know, architects, the sculptures that we see. I didn't know what to expect. And I remember seeing this figure next to me who'd bent over, had rested his forehead on his hand and he was, had his elbow kneeling on his knee. And I remember the wings tucked in and it was like, something like, how can I help you or how can I serve you or be assistance? It was something that he'd said. And, or you, there was something that I felt that because I'd called out, then like an angel came in to, to help me. And I remember all I could hear was Michael, Archangel Michael. And, and I remember the thing, the thinking, oh my God, <laughs> little old me calling upon an angel didn't think that was going to happen didn't think I just like I remember I was so scared I couldn't breathe and I remember them being by my side and it felt as if they were huge like 30 40 50 foot tall and it was a big presence and it felt as if like this heavy weight of them kneeling beside me offering me assistance it felt as if it was like a heavy stone or marble or something that landed by my side and I remember the pressure was taken off my lungs to some degree. I, I could feel I could breathe, but I, I, I knew that I needed some help. And I just I felt that there was this presence that were there to help me, to make me feel calm, to help me feel safe. And that, that I knew I was going to get some assistance. So the thumping sound, my daughter had heard it from downstairs and she ran up. She was a teenager there. She went upstairs and she then called the ambulance she didn't see anything but I remember feeling the presence of the angel by my side but I think it was the thumping sound because she'd heard that because I couldn't call out to her that by hearing the thumping sound she heard it and she ran up to see if I was okay and came to check on me and then called the ambulance and then they drained my lung because it just collapsed so that was that experience and I think that was really about helping me to learn that there are such things as angels. And I didn't believe it until that moment. But that was that that was that big lesson in that one. So it it just felt when that was happening, I didn't even feel I was in the room sitting on the sofa anymore when I was in the presence of an angel. It just I felt calm. It just felt very strange, but very calm. So that was that it was a real wake up call to angels. And then the next one I had, the third one. Again, they've all been showing me stuff. So the third one was different. I had gone for an operation and that was 2018 that happened. I had an operation and it should have been really straightforward and so easy and so simple. And I remember walking down to theatre with the holding the pillow and the nurses walking with me. And I remember laying down there on the actual trolley thing in the operating theatre. And I remember you know, talking and chatting and had the drip put in. And I remember them giving me gas in air. I remember it was females. And I remember it was in a blue sort of theatre room in the big light above my head. Then I remember that and I remember them giving me gas in air and then I was counting backwards and then I, I just felt like, like, like a deep sleep sort of thing, just like, you know, went off. And the next minute, I was again in this white space, not a room as such. There was no walls to it, but this white space. And again, I felt very calm, very collective. And I remember that there was an individual that stepped forward and he was, he had sort of a fringe, a funny fringe that was halfway up his forehead. Cause I remember looking at his head and I was like, that's really weird. And he had dark hair. And I remember he had these thin rimmed glasses, like Harry Potter glasses. And he was dressed, he might be like a dentist or some somebody medical, but like a dentist. And he was wearing this white uniform of such. And I saw that he had like a flip chart. So it's like, there must have been something that 
counting people in or seeing if your name was on the list or something. And I remember him looking at me and he was really cross with me, piercing eyes looking at me. And he was probably thinking, you've got to go back. It's not time. You've got to go back. Why are you here? And I remember I felt like a child. I was like, what the hell? And I was like, I felt really disappointed and sad. Like, why am I being told off? And I remember him turning over to his shoulder and he's saying, I'm telling her, she's got to go back. You've got to go back. And he was telling them on the other side that he was trying to tell them that I had to go back. And I remember this feeling of like, oh my God, I've done it again. Whoops, I've come back out of my body again. What's happened? And this whole feeling that he was there. And it just, in a way, that experience sort of made me sort of learn that there is no pain when you pop out of your body. When you die, there is no pain. So there is no pain. And there's always somebody on the other side to catch you or to guide you. Like with my nan, you know, I loved her. You know, she looked after me up until the age of 15. She was a big thing in my life, a big person, lots of love. So it made me aware that that lesson from that life also that, you know, loved ones come to collect you, keep you safe, you know, and only our archangels can come in to help us when we actually ask for help and when it's not time for us to die and they know that we've, you know, we, we're here, we're going to live. And in that one, it was like almost like a guide that I stepped forward and so I said, hey, what are you doing? You, you've got the wrong time frame. You're not meant to be here yet. And so they sent me back. And I remember the feeling of like, I felt really disappointed, really sad that I was coming back again because it was this feeling of feeling calm. And I don't have that. I didn't have that calmness in my life at that time. And again, so I had to come back. And then the next minute I know there was bells ringing everywhere and looking up and being awake that my heart had stopped for a couple of minutes and all the sirens were going off. The anesthetists were checking on me to make sure I was okay. The nurse next to me was holding my hand, saying, are you okay? And I said, where's that man? And she said, what man? I said, that white man, he's got these glasses. And said, no, no, it's just only us. So I knew then I popped out my body again. So it was like, oh, okay. I remember that feeling very well. And it sort of reactivated the memories I'd had from the first one. And it was just a reminder that you're not ready to go yet. You're not finished. So it was just my body had failed me. My heart had let me down again, but I was back. And, and I also was told that I came back with this information feeling that there was something bigger that was meant to do. There was something more information I was meant to do. And through having those experiences, you know, I started learning about, you know, channeling and being a psychic medium, all that came up for me. I'd been a counselor before and I knew that I was here to help on the soul level of others, to help them with their journey. You know, the confusion of when you, are awoken spiritually it's not sometimes not the easy passage to go down and they really made me aware that I was here to help others to help them to move into what they're going to do and I remember feeling that you know helping others to find their life purpose or helping others to transition into learning out what it is you're going to be doing next sort of thing and so you know I do this regularly now I channel and I'm a psychic medium and stuff and now very much connected to light council and they give me information about you know what's happening on the planet and how I can help people and building a platform at the moment and so it's a resource bank so people can get that information because there's so much out there information wise about the spiritual journey but it's actually finding others that are very like-minded to yourself and knowing it's a safe environment it's so easy to come across the wrong people and you know, they're telling you information and it's not necessarily correct. So I learned that from them that sort of the work they want me to do and like my purpose and why I'm here. So that was my third near death experience. And uh, yeah, last year I had a, a brain bleed and a mini stroke in uh, February, February the 14th in 2022. But I, I just was told I had to come back. It wasn't, it wasn't so significant. It was my brain shut down, but that was, I was told. I was rewiring, my brain was rewiring and hell, they were going to use me and work with me energetically. So there was no, I didn't feel my body leave. There was none of that, but I was told it was just like rewiring my brain and my energy. So yeah, that's what's happened. Wow. And thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. So I heard you in another interview sharing about how, I believe it was with 
Jeff Reynolds, and he asked you if you had a life review. And you said that in that first near-death experience, when you were in the place that you call the Hall of Souls, that you saw things about this life and past lives even. And I think you mentioned that. Do you remember any of those past lives? Oh, yeah, I do. I really do. Because also, I'm a past life practitioner. I trained with Brian Wise out in America at the MEGA Institute. And because I'm a, a clinical hypnotherapist as well. So I remember looking, I needed to question what I'd seen in that near death, um, near death experience, the first one. And I remember seeing it because I remember that the partner I had in this lifetime during that time when I had my first near death experience was I was so unhappy and I couldn't understand why I was brought to this individual, why, why I felt so unhappy in that relationship. And that past life was very much, because in this lifetime, it's very much about controlling money and uh, I'd say narcissistic tendencies and stuff like that. And I remember in that past lifetime that it was during sort of Victorian times, I think it was, or maybe even a little bit earlier, that I was a chimney sweep, that I was a little boy. So it was really strange. I was a young boy. And he wasn't our father, but we were street kids. I remember my son in this lifetime and my daughter in this lifetime were in that lifetime together. So we carry around in soul pods. So the soul lessons we need to learn, it's like our soul pods. We learn different information. So because something was unresolved in a previous lifetime, we end up carrying it through into the next lifetime so that we can see if we can address the issues that come up. So in a past life before, he was, we were three children together. I was the middle uh, sibling. So I was a, so I was a boy in that lifetime. My son, who's my youngest child in this lifetime was my oldest brother and my daughter in this lifetime, she was my youngest sister. So I was the middle child, the boy in that lifetime, in the past life. And I was forced to go up inside the chimney and my partner in this lifetime used to take the money. So I... I was really ill in that lifetime. So how it all started was because in this lifetime, I have a lung condition and they tried to find out what was going on and why I have the lung condition. And they said, do you smoke? I said, no, but my lungs are equivalent to a person that smokes about a thousand cigarettes a day. So they're damaged. So they couldn't understand why they were so badly damaged. So where they couldn't find out in this lifetime as me being at, where the damages come from, they put it down to something else. But I traced it back with Brian Wise and we looked at it that it was scarring from when, you know, it was previous scarring from a past life, but we couldn't work out what it was at the time. But when I was in the Hall of Souls, I was being shown that I'd lived a lifetime with my partner before, where I was a chimney sweep and I was placed up into chimneys and then all the soot had damaged my lungs. So back in that lifetime, my son, who was my brother then, helped me to escape and run away and flee and put me on a boat, a sailing boat, and I ran away and escaped. So in this lifetime as Anne, was really important that I had to learn or I had to take the step in leaving my partner. So I've, I've left my partner now. And so I've resolved that issue around money with him. So I will not come back in a future lifetime with him controlling me with money again. So that's what, you know, with the past lives, we, it, I mean, I do that now for my clients that as a past life practitioner and a counsellor, I take them back. If they're in a relationship, what's going on? Why is that person being brought into your life? Go back to see where, where that could be and where I access the Akashic records for them too. So I overlay a lot of my modalities I've learned so I can help people to sort of move forward. But that was one of the lifetimes that was revealed to me when I had this live review going back of past lives. So yeah, it was crazy, but good. It was really good. Wow. So it's fascinating to me how lives can be connected like that, so that you had lung damage in a previous lifetime, but yet you still experience that scarring today. Yeah. And, and people today, they might have injuries or ailments that have happened to them in its lifetime, and they're wondering how or why have I got an ongoing issue? And they can be traced through past lives where it's about looking at and wounds, love wounds, you know, as in having a, you know, a love situation with a soulmate that hasn't been resolved. You end up having that soulmate come back in this lifetime 
to reactivate that so you can heal it. And how would you go about healing a wound from a past life? Right. Well, the thing is, you've really got to look where it was held in a past life first. What past life was it held in? And what you can do is when I have clients, I always sort of say to them, let's look, that's what's going on for you in this relationship. Or if they're not in a relationship, it's about then physically now. We look at how does it affect you? How does it affect your life? How does it emotionally affect you? Because your body is emotionally storing whatever it is that's going on for you right now in your life, you're holding on to it. Then if I can't find that it's from an emotional issue here now, in this lifetime, we trace it back as far as we can. I might do it for a past life hypnosis, or I will ask my team, my guides will come in, and they'll give me some indication where it could be coming from. We then trace it back to where the issue is. And it, it's normally uh, triggered off by a relationship, an emotional tie in this lifetime. So we, we follow it back and we start investigating it. And from the moment we start investigating it, what lessons can you learn from it in this lifetime? And then we go back to what lessons could you have learned in that lifetime? You start releasing it, letting go. So the one you start releasing the one, it's almost like as if, like a boil, you pierce it, you go in, you get the pus out, you take it out. And then we send healing back. We use an NLP technique because I'm an NLP practitioner too. So we use a, a technique where we can say to the person that we are here now, we heal it, but it goes back healing all the way through ancestrally and then also goes back through past life as well. And I would love to give you an opportunity to talk about where the viewers can find you and what, what you offer. I know you said that you're a past life practitioner. Is there anything else that you do? Yeah, I mean, on my website, www.ambayford.com, that's one of the websites that you can find me on. I'm building at the moment. It's a new adventure because I was channeled this information to build this new idea. It's going to be called Odyssey the Platform. And it will be, you know, obviously www dot that Odyssey the Platform dot com. There, that's a brand new website that we're up and going. So we're looking at March onwards, we'll be going live where what happens is my guides have been communicating with me. I, because of the work that I do, I'm a counselor, NLP practitioner, mindfulness practitioner, past life practitioner, a medium where I combine everything that I've learned, which they have directed me every part of my journey. They've told me what I needed to learn you know, from the science of psychology and the spiritual stuff that it all will, it goes to help individuals. So on this platform, there will be other practitioners that they have said they want to join me. It will be a resource bank where people can find information about, you know, spirituality plus the psychology of who they are. It will have a collection of different people and there'll be free webinars and there'll be some courses and workshops that will all be placed on this. So if people are going through that spiritual awakening, and they don't know where to go. They can literally go onto this main website and find the information. But if you follow onto my website, there is a link there that will take you through. And I have my Instagram and Facebook again, and Bayford, where they can find information. I do daily information on my Instagram and where I give some information about what I'm channeling or what I'm receiving daily. So it's there to help anybody, to be honest. And it's free, those bits. Yeah. Wonderful. I will have all those links in the description. And thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us today. This hour has just flown by. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, share this video with your friends, and comment with your thoughts and opinions. And check the description box for the links to my TikTok and Instagram where I share the more personal side of my life, my website where I share my paintings and merch, and also the Be A Guest link for anybody who's interested in sharing their story. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.